This is the third time I've spoken at the lecture series. I've yet to actually talk about a surgical uh, disease. Uh, I, I, they somehow think I'm a medical doctor because they talk about infections. Last time it was a very good lecture at 7 a.m. Saturday morning on biomechanics of spine fixation. And now I'm going to talk about osteoporosis. So someday I may get lucky enough to talk about something surgical. However, uh, Everything's going to go bad if you're dealing with this kind of patient with osteoporosis. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, none of these are relevant to my talk, with the exception I am on AOA, American Orthopedic Association, on the Bone Steering Committee, which makes me very passionate about talking about osteoporosis. So my objectives, I'm going to go over the epidemiology, some diagnostic criteria, a uh, little bit about pharmacologic management, pre the idea of preoperatively optimizing patients with metabolic bone disease, and then secondary fracture prevention for those patients who have osteoporotic-related vertebral fractures. Uh, first of all, uh, this, as we know, is an epidemic in disease. There's about uh, 50 million people in 2010 have either osteopenia or osteoporosis. And that's going to go to 70 million at least in 20 years from now. Actually, 15 years from now, it'll be over 70 million people will have osteoporosis. If you look at just hospitalizations related to fragility fractures, uh, it's over 1 million a year in the United States. And uh, fairly close uh, is hip fractures have the most. And then spine fractures are second, fairly close to hip fractures. And most of the epidemiologic data is a very similar between hip and spine, with the exception spine has a lot more fractures, but many of them are subclinical or asymptomatic, as we know. Uh, and uh, this was, I thought, an interesting article. You don't see too many articles talking about the three Ds, death, debility, and destitution. And this is the outcome of many people with uh, fragility fractures. And this happened to be just hip fractures, but probably it's not too dissimilar to spine fractures. Uh, they took a database study out in California, had one year follow-up. First of all, what is debility? And that means transfer from community living to um, higher level skilled nursing living. Destitution means, and the way they analyzed this was they went from standard Medicare recipient to a supplemented Medicare recipient, recipient or to Medicaid. In other words, they got supplements for them because of uh, turning out poor after their fracture. And what do we see? And they had a comparator group of people uh, with the same age and gender uh, who didn't have fractures. And uh, mortality rate in hip fractures, 28% at one year. Most orthopedic surgeons know this. Uh, spine fractures mortality rate is about 25% at one year for osteoporotic fragility fractures. Debility, 20% uh, of those patients ended up changing their living situation, and 6% uh, became poorer uh, after these fractures. So really things we need to try to avoid. Now, after a spine fracture, one of the things is what do we do to prevent the next one? And first of all, how often does that happen? This is the best studies out of Manitoba. They followed 2,600 patients with vertebral fracture, followed them up. That's a Kaplan-Meier curve. And showing that the spine fractures paralleled the hip fractures and that there's about a 20% incidence at 10 year of having another spine fracture. The highest risk occurs within the first year, and that's 6 to 8% within the first year. Well, what about if we operate on somebody? Does osteoporosis mean anything? Well, it's very important. Uh, we're going to hear shortly from Dr. Brodke about proximal junction kyphosis. And you, if you want to, you could predict that whether it's going to happen or not by examining their bone quality before you do your osteotomy or long fusion. This is a study out of a uh, hospital for special surgery where they looked at long fusions, matched them, and compared preoperative Hounsfeld units, and they found uh, the Hounsfeld unit, and I'll talk more about this, this, is an index of bone mineral density at the top vertebrae, and showed that if you had osteoporosis, which would be below 150 Hounsfeld units, you had sig six significantly higher chance of having a proximal junction fracture uh, 
with kyphosis. So uh, look, it looks like paying attention to this ahead of time may help give you a better outcome. So uh, unfortunately, we don't know the threshold. Well, what are the biologic problems we're going to see if we operate on somebody with osteoporosis? Well, we might see failure fixation. We might see pseudoarthrosis. Uh, it turns out that stem cells are not activated as well in osteoporotic patients. Uh, if you're vitamin D deficient, you're going to have impaired mineralization. And last time I looked, uh, a fusion requires mineral mineralization of the osteoid matrix. So if you're vitamin D deficient, maybe that's not going to care occur. And then also see proximal junction failure. So what can we do about this uh, before surgery? And should we do something? I would advocate, of course, you should do something and try to optimize patient's uh, bone before doing major operations, particularly when you're talking about multi-level fusions, osteotomies, and the such. So we want to get a better healing response, get the osteoblasts jacked up so they'll heal. We want to correct bone density for our fixation. Uh, will stay in place, correct vitamin D deficiency. Uh, oftentimes, this will need the use of bisphosphonates or even anabolic agents such as teriparatide, which is also known as Forteo. So what are some of the specific uh, molecular biologic effects? Well, uh, it turns out it affects both the inflammatory response as well as the healing response. And, Inflammatory response, if you look at macrophages, for instance, uh, they're very important for the initial inflammatory uh, effect that's going to lead to osteoid formation and finally mineralization. This is blunted. Uh, there are fewer macrophages around, and they're also harder to stimulate into activated macrophages, which is necessary for the first stage of bone healing. This is potentially modified, and there are a number of biologic agents that maybe can improve this milieu so we get better macrophage response in osteoporosis. Uh, stem cells. There are, first of all, fewer stem cells in patients who have osteoporosis. Uh, they are uh, also have decreased proliferative capacity, and they're much harder to turn into osteoblasts. And this is sex-related in that women have far worse problem than men do with this particular problem. Well, what is the effect of all of this on bone healing? What do we know? And these are based on largely animal studies where you can control one variable. If you look at oophorectomized uh, uh, rats, which is a typical model for osteoporosis, uh, vitamin D replacement significantly improves bone healing. If you look at bisphosphonates, and this is a big question, is should we have patients on bisphosphonates? Should we continue them? Should we not let them take? You know, we don't know the answer to this. Well, the data is conflicting. Uh, it does not appear to affect bone healing, so that uh, people on bisphosphonates seem to heal fractures of their extremity and spine, for that matter. Uh, there is changes in how it heals, though. So bisphosphonate-exposed patients will have smaller callus formation, but actually, it's, paradoxically, there's actually increased strength of callus. So it will change how it heals, but it doesn't change whether it's going to or not. How that translates to a spine fusion, I, I truthfully don't know. Teriparatide, which is an anabolic agent, certainly increases bone healing. And if you give teriparatide and a bisphosphonate, that's even the best situation, surprisingly. Well, uh, what about just vitamin D deficiency? Does that occur? Uh, well, pretty much everybody has vitamin D deficiency. In Wisconsin, there's virtually no human being in the winter not going to be vitamin D deficient. Probably, I think Seattle actually has a higher latitude, so it's probably even as bad in Seattle. But these are three studies that just show uh, the distribution between normal, which is greater than 30, insufficient, and deficient. Uh, and Asians are much worse, and this was out of Korea, but and I'm not sure if it applies to Asians in Seattle, and I used to operate on quite a few of them, but I would assume that most Asians in Seattle are going to be vitamin D deficient before you uh, operate on them, would be my guess. Uh, so does, this, does vitamin D deficiency, is that important for us? This was a, a study uh, out of Utah. Uh, I don't know where Dr. Brotke's name's not on this one. How'd that happen, Daryl? <laughs> 
Do you know these guys? <laughs> anyway, they looked at vitamin D deficient and normal. 71% fusion rate in vitamin D deficient. Normal had 88%. This is statistically significant. Um, and they did a multivariate analysis because these patients were somewhat different. They had comorbidity, so really need to look at these kind of data with a multivariate uh, analysis. The odds ratio was 3.4 uh, for vitamin in favor of vitamin D normal level, uh, indicating that uh, vitamin D deficiency significantly in, uh, affects the outcome of spine fusion. What about pain itself? We, we know we're operating on people to uh, relieve their pain. This is an interesting story from uh, in a pain magazine or pain journal. Uh, about 350 patients with lumbar spinal stenosis. And again, Korea, very vitamin D deficient. Their average vitamin D was 14, which is really low. And then they categorized them, graded them just by severe, severe back pain, severe leg pain, severe back and leg pain. And the odds ratio, in other words, if they were vitamin D deficiency, they were three times more likely to have severe back and leg pain than those who had normal values. So it somehow looks like their pain scores were much worse if they were vitamin D deficient. These are non-operative patients. These are patients uh, who had not had surgery yet. They proposed a hypothetical uh, 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 mechanism for this that pain, they get limited exposure, induced hypercalcemia, appetite impairment, hypovitamin D, low bone mineral density, and then hypovitamin D induced pain. This is kind of their mechanism for this. This is purely theoretical. Uh, so can we do something about this? Well, certainly if a patient has a known fragility fracture, they all need to be treated for secondary fracture prevention. This is the one program American Orthopedic Surgery is uh, pushing. Uh, there, there are programs in the Northwest for this. Northwest Hospital, in fact, is part of this and has a very robust uh, secondary fracture prevention program. And the idea is to provide osteoporotic management because, unfortunately, we can send patients to their internists and say, hey, this patient probably has osteoporosis. Please work it up and get them treated. And it just doesn't ever happen. It just does not happen. And despite the orthopedic surgeons for 20 years have been trying to get primary care to do this, so this is now where orthopedic surgeons, but there's no reason a neurologic surgeon could not get involved in a program. We're not saying that surgeons need to be ordering medications. This is all run by nurse practitioners. Uh, but just getting patients to such a program, it would be very important for them. Does this work? Uh, well, this is a study out of University of Chicago. It was published last year in Journal Bone and Joint Surgery. And they looked at a large database, Medicare database study, and they looked at which patients got anti-osteoporosis treatment after their first fragility fracture and whether did they have a second one. And if you went into a secondary fracture prevention program, got treatment for your osteoporosis, you reduced your chance of the next fracture by 40%. There aren't very many things that can give you that much bang for the buck because this is not all that expensive. Mark Swinkowski from University of Minnesota, used to be chair of orthopedics at Harborview, uh, did a study on his own secondary fracture prevention on just hip fractures. And the patients who got uh, uh, secondary fracture prevention had a 6% secondary hip fracture compared to 15%. So a threefold reduction in your chance of having your other hip broken just by secondary fracture prevention. So. Unfortunately, it's poorly done by primary care, and there's also, you could send them to bone health specialists. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a six-month visit usually. Uh, I know Susan Ott is here at the university, and it used to take forever to, for her to see a patient. Uh, but so the idea is surgeons take the baton, lead these programs, get patients, and if you're not leading it, at least find a program in your community and get the patient to the right person. And it really isn't that difficult. Uh, so I'm going to move on to how do we even diagnose osteoporosis? How many think you diagnose osteoporosis by DEXA? That's pretty much used to be the standard of care. It's not anymore. Uh, DEXA scan is actually quite imprecise if you use that alone. And so rather than using an absolute score based on bone mineral density, 
uh, you really are now determining fracture risk, es estimating fracture risk. So that's what we're thinking about is not so much an absolute score on bone mineral density, but what is their fracture risk? And I'll show you how you do that. First of all, this was the old school World Health Organization. Normal is a T-score. Remember, a T-score is a statistical comparison against women in their 20s. So they look at the bone mineral density of the patient, compare it to 20s, get some kind of fancy statistics, and you get a T-score. Osteopenia, that word is drummed out. Uh, it's now low bone mass. And that's between minus 1 and 2.5, and then osteoporosis. And then if you've had a fracture and you have osteoporosis, or yeah, is less than, two, uh, less than minus 2.5, then that's severe osteoporosis. Uh, this, first of all, only applies to Caucasian women in only hip, spine, and wrist fracture, but it only explains half the injury, half the fractures. So it wasn't very precise. So the Bone Health Alliance a couple years ago published this thing where they look at fracture risk assessment. They combine bone mineral density as well as a functional assessment. In other words, has the patient had a fragility fracture and proven they have low bone quality. So it's a risk, accession, they, uh, risk assessment. They use the FRAX. How many have heard of the FRAX before? Okay. So FRAX is a fracture prediction tool that is, going, that is currently driving treatment. And it's a prediction tool to uh, uh, identify 10-year hip fracture risk and 10-year all fracture risk. And it really determines medical treatment. It's approved by the FDA. Here's a, uh, a FRAX questionnaire. And I put in kind of one of my typical patients, 69-year-old female, a little bit heavy, typical of Wisconsin, and doesn't take glucocorticoids. You go through, you answer these questions. You don't need a T-score, so they don't have to have a T-score. It's more precise if they have it. Uh, put in their T-score, uh, and then you get hit calculate, and you get this red box back. And this red box is the 10-year prediction of osteoporotic-related hip fracture and all fractures. So major orthopedic fracture is 36%, hip fracture is 15%. The cutoffs are for this are uh, hip fractures greater than 3% need treatment. Osteoporotic fractures greater than 20% need treatment. So this patient certainly would need treatment with like a bisphosphonate. So again, 3% for hip fractures, all fractures 20. Uh, this is, a, you just type in Google, type in FRAX, you'll get to the website and you can put your own in if you want and see what your fracture risk is. Um, so that's how we now diagnose osteoporosis. Uh -oh. uh, now, in addition, you look at, if they had a fracture, you look at the fragility mechanism. And if they had a hip fracture, it doesn't matter what their bone mineral density is. If they had a fragility fracture, in other words, a low energy fracture of the hip, they have osteoporosis, end of story. If they've had a low bone mass, that's minus 1.1 to minus 2.5, and they've had a vertebral fracture, proximal humerus pelvis, then they would have, os, quote, osteoporosis. So it would be upgraded if they've already demonstrated. Uh, wrist fracture, they, they're inconclusive. They could not get an uh, agreement on that, whether a wrist fracture gets you osteoporosis or not. So I'm going to talk about some other spinal densitometries just to be aware of. Some of these may be very relevant to us. There's opportunistic CT, vertebral fracture assessment, and trabecular bone scores. Uh, and the idea is that DEXA is, is again, only about 50% predictive. So we want to look at other considerations that DEXA and even the FRAX doesn't include. It's like quality of bone, distribution of bone, and also fall potential. So uh, how CT Hounsfeld units, this is how CT scan works is it calculates for each volume of little tiny volume boxes of tissue, x-ray energy is absorbed, it calculates how much x-ray energy, and it assigns its a value. The values are normalized as air is minus 1,000 and water is zero. They're put on a grayscale and they print the thing out. That's what we're looking at based on the Hounsfeld units. Well, we get a good idea of how much calcium is in that piece of bone, so we get free information when you have have a CT scan, there's a lot of free information about bone quality. Here is, for instance, and every PAC system will do that. 
you go to your tools, you measure region of interest, draw an ellipse or a circle, and lo and behold, you'll get an average score, which is the average Hounsfeld units in that piece. So you can see the tra inside the trachea air, and this one was minus 900. Cancellous bone was this patient had osteoporosis, and I'll show you why, and a minus of, was 106. Muscles about 40 to 50. As you get fatty replacement of muscle, that number drops. Uh, fat is actually a negative Hounsfeld unit. And so it's one way you can tell a patient has a disease called sarcopenia by measuring fat content in those muscles. And cortical bone is like a thousand in the in the skull here. So this is a study I published uh, looking at, based on DEXA scans but measuring Hounsfeld units. Just some numbers to remember. You probably should be above 150. If you're not above, if your patient's Hounsfeld units of the trabecular bone in the spine is more than 150, you probably are, or I'm sorry, it's less than 150, you're probably dealing with some bone disease. If it's less than 100, you're probably osteoporotic. Just some simple numbers. Uh, the other thing that's coming into use, and this is available on any DEXA scan, you can order this separately if you desire. It's called vertebral fracture assessment. And what this does is it takes orthogonal x-ray of the spinal column and then measures anterior, middle, and posterior heights. And then it calculates ratios. And if those ratios exceed norms, then it's diagnosed as a occult fracture. Uh, and it compares this to standard. So this is, first of all, it tells you if there's uh, uh, unknown fractures. And it turns out there's a lot of them. So this would be an example, this is one of the VFAs, there's a severe compression fracture of L1 that happened to be asymptomatic. Um, and so it can identify in patients 65 years old, for instance, without osteoporosis, there's somewhere between 10 and 28% incident fractures that nobody knew about. And in 10% of the time, they identify a fracture that necessitates change of treatment, not of their spine condition, but of their bone disease. So it does help, uh, help you figure out if the patient needs to be on medicine. This would be the indications for VFA. I don't think we need to spend much time on that. So. Another one is trabecular bone score. This is getting more to the physiology of the bone. This is something surgeons can understand a little bit better. And basically, it's trying to count up how much bone you have over a certain area, and it uh, com again, it compares it to standards. This is called TBS. This is uh, FDA approved, but no insurance company pays for it. So right now, it's kind of a research tool, but I think it'll help us in the uh, future. Uh, here would be a uh, you get a sum of scores based on all these little boxes and how dark and how gray those boxes are, and like the top green one, the TBSA of 1.3 versus 1.1. That doesn't sound like a lot different. But if you plot it out, oops, sorry, you get a lot of the same kind of drawings we see on DEXAs where you get norms and you can see how many standard deviations you are. This is highly, much more predictive than FRAX, for instance, for predicting fr future fractures. It's just not in clinical use yet. So let's talk about some treatment. Nutritional support is very important. We all know we need 1,200 milligrams. Adults need 1,200 milligrams of calcium. It turns out the average person in the United States gets about 700 milligrams in their diet. You can go to CDC calculators if, if you want. Patients can go look at that. And so you generally you need to give about 500 more milligrams to 1,000 more milligrams a day of calcium. Obviously, the problems here is if they uh, have some kidney disease and other problems, they might get hypercalcemic. What about vitamin D? Well, I, I mentioned the levels. We want to have levels over 30. Uh, you're insufficient if you're 20 to 30, and you're deficient if you're less than 20. Uh, they sometimes can be reported in different quantities depending on your hospital. Most people are nowadays reporting in nanograms per milli milliliter, but some people report nanomoles per liter, and that's a 2.5 ratio. And, you know, I never did understand units of pharmaceuticals. I have no idea what that means. But one milligram is 40,000 units of vitamin D3, it turns out. So uh, supplement uh, for maintenance, it's uh, the simplest thing to do is tell a patient take 2,000 units of vitamin D3 a day. And it doesn't matter if they're male or female. 
if they're insufficient, you want to increase that. So you want to go two to 5,000 a day and then recheck in six or eight weeks. If they're deficient, you hit them hard. You give them 50,000 units uh, weekly, sometimes twice a weekly for six weeks, and then recheck uh, vitamin D levels. You should always use vitamin D3. It's much more potent than vitamin D2. Vitamin D3 is what's produced in the skin. So don't use vitamin D2, except for the 50,000 units. For some reason, it only comes as vitamin D2. Let's talk about the drugs now, bisphosphonates, Forteo. And there are really two forms. One are anti-resorptive agents that are going to prevent resorption of bone. And then the other ones are anabolic, where we're getting more bone form. So they're going to work differently on osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And they're, the anti-resorptives are bisphosphonates, calcitonin, denosumab, which is a biologic rank ligand inhibitor, and then estrogens. The anabolics are teriparatide. Uh, first line, you always start with uh, a bisphosphonate and then only move on to any of these others if those fail. Indications for teriparatide are problematic in that insurance companies usually say no. This is $2,000 a month of injectable, and you're probably going to do that for two years. It's very potent, and, and frankly, if I had my druthers, every patient we're doing spine fusion on should be on teriparatide because it'll probably increase your fusion rate, and it'll certainly speed it up. Question is, how long do these drugs get treated? Uh, there's little data after five years. Uh, and usually somewhere around three to five years, patients reassess for risk factors to decide if they should continue or not. If they're only moderate risk, they consider taking a holiday. But if their se severe risk persists, let's say still on high dose prednisone, for instance, then they should continue with treatment. There's no doubt that when you stop taking bisphosphonates, you drop your bone mineral density. You may not drop your fracture risk, but you drop your bone mineral density. Big concern in orthopedics is atypical fever fractures. Uh, and what these are, stress fractures, uh, probably due to the lack of remodeling of bone. Patients get stress fractures, can break through, and they come in with a subtrochanteric fracture in the lateral cortex. Oftentimes, it's a bilateral. <laughs> this has been put on TV that bisphosphonates cause fractures. So now we got, a, we got a, a lot of blowback from patients when we're recommending these drugs because they're afraid of getting one of these uh, uh, atypical femur fractures. Uh, so there's no doubt the longer you take a bisphosphonate, the higher your risk of this is. And this is two, five, and 10 years. Uh, at 10 years of use of bisphosphonate, your risk is 1.2%, which is uh, pretty high, actually, I think. Or it's, I'm sorry, it's 1.2 cases per thousand, so it's 0.12% risk. Well, if you uh, look at epidemiologic statistics, though, for every fracture that you cause by this uh, atypical fracture, you are preventing somewhere between 15 and 1,000 fractures. So this is what you got to tell patients, that, yeah, it could occur, but you're preventing 100 to other frac fractures uh, by taking the medication. Doesn't work always. So what, in summary, what are our recommendations? Well, I think you should consider preoperative pre optimization. And what does that mean? It means getting a DEXA scan, and it means getting vitamin D levels and correcting those if they're abnormal and getting them on medication. And this may, a lot of people, and I think SIG in San Francisco, uh, are getting people on Forteo prior to major surgeries and will delay like a big spine fusion for six to 12 months uh, before, beforehand. If we're treating an osteoporotic fracture, then certainly get them involved in a secondary fracture prevention program, either through a program like Own the Bone or through primary care, endocrine, or whoever does that in your area. Other things that all of us can talk about is calcium and vitamin D, treat the vitamin D deficiencies, recommend regular weight-bearing exercises, if they had a fracture, they should be in a fall prevention program. And obviously, if they do bad things like smoke and drink excess alcohol, kind of like rot here, then you got to get them to stop. So thank you very much.